How's everybody doing? I'm tired. Last day after lunch. I'll try not to be boring, but uh, you know, there's a lot of technologies out there. Uh, teaching you how. Sorry. Sorry. I can't help it. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's a lot of stuff out there. It's you know, there's a lot of companies that are building products that do the same thing or similar things. So I'm going to take a step back. Um, we're going to talk about what it means to be cloud native. Um, my name is Mike Mayhew. I'm from a company uh, called GoToGroup. We have a booth back there. We provide professional services. We basically help companies uh, develop software better through best practices uh, and tooling. So we're partners with CloudBees. We're partners with Atlassian. Um, so I'm going to type in AWS. And really, we're kind of a boutique company. We have what I call full stack developers, guys that really understand the whole development life cycle. Um, you know, in conferences like this, everybody's talking about DevOps and uh, more deep tech uh, topics. But it really is still uh, what requirements all the way to delivery is really what we're talking about to this day. Um, I come from a software developer background. I was a Java programmer back in 2000. Not to tell my age, but I was at one of the first Java uh, one conferences before Red Hat IPO. So I've seen a lot of tragedies and things like that. I've worked with a lot of large companies in the financial and insurance uh, business. So uh, today, again, what I want to talk about is what it means to be cloud native because it's a new concept uh, as we all in companies are moving to the cloud. Um, one of the things you're definitely going to need to become cloud native or be cloud native is probably some suntan lotion because when you're up in the clouds, it's kind of like direct sunlight. Just kidding. Uh, no. <laughs> Three of the things you're going to need to be cloud native are DevOps, which a lot of most of this is about microservices architecture for your application. So not only are we talking about tooling and pipelines and delivery, uh, but we're also talking about changing the architecture of our actual applications. Um, and then also containers. So how many of you guys are using containers? And how many microservice architecture? One? Okay. So um, I did a talk many, many years ago about model view controller, which is a design pattern for development. And um, I was one of the first speakers to talk about Java beans and storing data and objects and things like that. So uh, that's there's design patterns for your software, and then there's design patterns for how you make your software and how you split up your software. And that's what we'll talk about with microservices. But basically, cloud native, um, having cloud native or being cloud native is not about where you're going, um, but it's about how you're getting there. So digitally advanced enterprises uh, are eight more times likely to go gross share, but still lag behind digital natives. What that means is um, companies that are developing their application in a monolith fashion, they're lagging behind companies that are breaking their uh, applications into a microservices architecture because they're not as nimble, they're not as fast. So it's not just about your CI CD pipelines, it's about your teams, your team dynamics, the, the expertise being focused on particular parts of the applications. Um, so it's really uh, breaking it down and, and making it faster from a development standpoint and from a delivery standpoint and an automation standpoint. So there's a big difference between doing that with a, a broken a microservices application and a monolith type application. And we'll look at the difference differences in the architecture in, in a few minutes. Um, you know, we're not just building web applications anymore. There's AI, there's bots, there's blockchain, there's mobile. You know, one application does a lot of things, RESTful services. So cloud native architecture is built for running in the cloud. Um, AWS, Azure, whatever cloud you prefer. It could be private cloud, it could be open stack. Uh, but you're, you're building, the way you build your application is you're building it for the cloud. You're not building it for bare metal or server-side type deployments. And cloud native is also about how applications are created and deployed, not where they're going. Again, it's not because we're going to the cloud. 
that they're cloud native. It's the way that we're deploying them to the cloud, and the cloud uh, has certain requirements. Um, and if you're really going to do it right with containers and automation and things like that, you have to have your application in a certain microservices architecture. You have to be doing DevOps, agile, so not just how you're developing the application, but how you're iterating and sprinting and doing capacity planning. Again, back to all the even team dynamics. Who's the guy that's going to write the code for the, the business layer? Who's the guy that's going to write the front end code for what components of your application? Breaking the data structures apart from one big database to micro databases. And then again, containerization for faster and faster deployment. So cloud native delivery, uh, you know, most of these tools around here are about CI/CD pipelines and delivering code faster. Um, we all get agile. We know how to sprint. Um, we know how to write our code quickly. Uh, but what we're struggling with these days, or what a lot of companies struggle with, is how to deliver that code to your users as fast as you need to. Um, and it's usually not fast enough, and also with the precision that you need to without bugs and problems where you're going to be uh, going in circles. So they need to be reliable, repeatable, proven, and have known working processes. So this is where we get into the uh, domain layer scripting and um, automation around containers and things like Jenkins and Kubernetes that's going to help have repeatable uh, orchestration and repeat repeatable delivery mechanisms to where you're not manually doing anything. When you commit code, the, the developers should really be focusing on the code and, and their pull requests, and then what happens when a merge happens, that should all be repeatable and proven to deploy to whatever uh, cloud you're trying to get it to. So cloud native applications are modular and loosely coupled. Again, we'll look at the architecture in a second, but it's breaking the code apart. I'm sure everybody's had an experience where you're dealing with a huge application. There's a bunch of developers. And back in the day, uh, you know, the, the uh, business analysts or your user base with uh, product owners would give a bunch of requirements and the developers would get it and develop the code, uh, interpreting what they think that they were supposed to develop. Uh, and then at the very end, they'd throw it over to QA and then it would be going into these different environments and then it would go into a QA environment and QA would be like, WTF, it doesn't work, I can't log in, and then you go, you know, so it's just this horrible cycle. Um, when you break the application apart into smaller pieces, just like when we all took big requirements, you know, remember BDDs, and uh, this guy keeps going, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> but like, you know, 60, 90 page business design documents that we had to take, uh, well, now we're breaking the requirements down into stories, right, into features and smaller parts. Well, we need to do the same thing with our application. So, so the functionality is broken down into microservices that represent business functionality, just like a story would be from an epic, right? And um, their loosely coupled nature allows us to deploy parts of the application without affecting the entire application. It's a very critical part. So the key benefits of being cloud native are auto provisioning, um, elasticity, so you're elastic, when you, you have, you know, there's cloud technologies that, that benefit us that, that we're going to take advantage of by, by uh, aligning with being cloud native. Auto redundancy, which is huge, uh, responding with uh, containers and things like that, and then precision. That's the, to me, that's the biggest one because it's, uh, you can go real fast, but you can also release a lot of bugs by going fast. Uh, and so if you're doing that, you're not really going as fast as you thought you were. So precision is key. So let's talk a little bit about DevOps. So within a year of Amazon moving to AWS, uh, engineers were deploying code every 11.7 seconds. I was actually going to put a slide after this that said WTF, because when I first read that, I was like, really? But the reason for that is, is because they're in a GitOps scenario where they're committing code and they're doing code merges. They, they're probably 99.7% test automation coverage, test coverage. So when they when they do a merge, it, it's being released into a container and it's literally in production in seconds, not minutes, not 30 minutes, not 15 minutes. So um, that's incredible. And 
there's going to be a couple of other slides, you know, that refer back to other companies, but this, this was uh, something that kind of caught my eye. So in order to deliver code that fast or to release your code that fast, um, you know, you're going to have to be cloud native these days. So DevOps is a culture. We know that it's practices and tooling. That's what GoToGroup does. We come in and we help, you know, align your JIRA with your CI/CD pipelines, whether it's Jenkins or, or CloudBees Flow, which looks awesome. Um, it's uh, it's just the, you know the ability to deliver your applications at a high velocity, so a lot faster. And again, the team focuses on code, there, that, which is where they should be. Developers don't. I remember when I was uh, there were certain developers that would uh, you know they would find mess around with Tomcat, Apache, and doing configuration stuff back in the day. But uh, most developers really wanted to be coding. They were they were passionate about how beautiful their code was and how well it would work and things like that. They don't want to be messing with deployments and, and uh, things that are more operations as we move into that DevOps space. So uh, let's let them focus on code and work in Git and the rest, let's automate it and get it, and get it fast. So GitOps is a popular methodology. Um, it's basically continuous delivery meets cloud native. So again, we're, we're allowing the developers to focus on code. Um, it's about pipelines. It's a perfect, perfect model for secure cloud native CICD pipelines. As they interact with code, things happen automatically. Things get tested automatically. They get deployed automatically quickly to containers into the cloud where they're safe and secure. Fast times to deployment, seconds. You can deploy a container with Kubernetes in literally a second, a minute, a second and a half, maybe two seconds. There's rollback. You can replace containers, pull, pull back images, swap out images, store images in your uh, in your Docker Hub. It's fast and it's reliable. And then monitoring, sorry. That's another huge thing is to be proactive monitoring, monitoring proactively. So you're looking at the health of your application. So you're not waiting until your application dies and being reactive. In these cases, we, we monitor with our Kubernetes dashboard. Um, or whatever other metrics you're, you're following, and you can react quickly before something bad happens. So we can't talk about microservices without mentioning Netflix. In 2008, when Netflix was still operating as a monolith, there was a single semicolon that brought the entire Netflix application down. That does not happen today, but it did happen in 2008. So we've come far since 2008. But that's why Netflix and all these other companies that have high volume, high traffic, high streaming content type applications are going to be cloud native. All right, so let's look at the architecture a little bit. So here's a monolith application that we're all familiar with. You, you know, you've got Apache, Tomcat, whatever front end. You've got a, a jar files or a war file that's being deployed to a Tomcat instance. You know, you buy some kind of service layer and things like that. It's using a, a single database. And you can see that there's everything's kind of within that one thing. It's it's modular the application. Yeah, they've sp split it apart into an accounting service and a shipping service, and there's a front end that's probably JavaScript, but it's still a monolith application. When we break it into a microservices architecture, um, we have first of all two different gateways: one for mobile RESTful API, and we've got browser app access. Um, the app, the services and Parts of the application are actually broken down into their own little mini applications, and they're deployed to their own containers with their own databases. So we've also split up the data structures, and they don't need to talk to each other because everything happens within the the uh, container, the container application itself. So that's the biggest difference between a monolith application and a microservices application. Microservice architecture is here to stay, and it's really the only way that you're going to be cloud native. Um, so you're going to have to start converting your application and converting your resources and teams, just like we did back in the day when we went from Waterfall to Agile. So the last thing that we need to be cloud native is containers. And everybody, how many of you, I think two, a couple of people were using Docker? Containers, are, I mean, it's enormous benefits, but the real thing is, is that obviously it's repeatable, it's automated, you can... Um, design what your application needs to go in the container. It's lightweight and it's just way faster than deploying a VM or a VPS on uh, Amazon or, or Google. And you can promote your containers and the uh, configuration of your containers and your application images 
based on YAML files and configuration files. Um, it's fast spin up, spin down, replication. And you can go from depth to production with the same, the same image. It's also scalable because you can create more and more uh, clones of your application. And lastly, to orchestrate all your containers when you're cloud native, you're going to need Kubernetes, which is probably every booth here has got the keyword somewhere. Uh, and um, Kubernetes is here to stay. I love Helm. I love Jenkins X. If you really want to uh, see how you can make a Kubernetes, or sorry, uh, a micro, a cloud native application work, check out Jenkins X. You can literally spin up a Kubernetes cluster in five seconds, maybe 10. And um, it's free, and you can learn how Docker works and containers and all that. It's an amazing product to learn Kubernetes, as I did last year when I did a talk on Kubernetes. But just to sum it up, cloud native ingredients, you've got to be agile. You've got to be have a microservices architecture. You've got to be in the cloud. You've got to have your sunscreen. You've got to be doing DevOps, using containers. And then you've got to be isolated and have governance around all that. If you don't have control over all that, it's, you're going to end up with a lot of containers all over the place and uh, all of them, maybe perhaps a big mess. But but that's those are the things that you need. It's kind of like a little trail to get you there. 